whenever you're ready. Well, good morning and welcome again to uh, our services this morning. Those here in the auditorium, those joining us on YouTube, or later in today, uh, joining us on Facebook. I said that backwards. Joining us on Facebook right now, perhaps, and then later in the day, some even on Facebook or YouTube uh, after it gets, uh, gets put on. I want to begin our uh, service this morning with a scripture reading, and following that, James Self will come and lead us in a prayer. If you were here in class, I told Dale that I'd already picked this, this scripture reading out before class, so it fits anyway, whether I'd picked it out earlier or not. Isaiah chapter 40, and I want to read beginning in uh, verse 28 through verse 31, the end of the chapter. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. James. Good morning, church. Will you bow with me, please? Our Holy Father, this morning as we approach you, we want to thank you for this avenue of prayer. Being able to pray to you, Father, is, gives us the ability to express our thanks to you and to lift up our supplications and our concerns to you. And we're very thankful that we have this avenue. We want to thank you this morning, Father, for life itself. We're thankful that we were born in this land of freedom and this land of plenty that we have. And we're thankful, Father, for the most part that our individual needs are more than adequately met. We give thanks for the generosity of so many, not only in our congregation, but sometimes in, across society, who freely give to meet the needs of others. And as we're made aware of these situations, Father, we, we pray that this will continue the help that this congregation might give to people as we're made aware of those situations. And locally, Father, we're very thankful for the congregation and their uh, contribution during this COVID-19 dilemma. Our weekly giving has maintained itself very nicely. It's enabled the church here to be able to pay whatever bills are necessary and to meet salaries for our employees. And we know that they're thankful for that. And we're thankful that it's been able to be done. Father, this COVID-19 situation has turned our world topsy-turvy. And so we thank you this morning, as far as we know, as far as I know right now, that none of our number have contracted the COVID-19. We pray, Father, this will continue to be the case. We're also very thankful, Lord, that during this time when we could not, during the time in the past when we could not meet together, that we were able to worship together remotely. That's a new concept for many of us and we're thankful, Father, that this was able to be done 
And even today, Lord, we're thankful that while many of us are able to be here to worship together and commune together, that there are others who cannot or could not be in, in a group meeting, they still can worship with us remotely and be a part of our, of our meeting. We're always thankful, Lord, for the blessings that we have through Jesus. We studied this morning about patience and, and about uh, the hope that we have as Christians. And we're thankful, Lord, that, that we do have the Jesus Christ who came and died for our sins. And because of that fact, we do have the promise and the hope for eternal life with you. We also want to give you thanks always for your word. We need the assurance and we need the encouragement and we need the comfort that comes from your word. And this is available to us every day if we will avail ourselves of the use of it. And so we thank you so much for that. We want to offer a special prayer this morning, Father, for the Dodds as Darcy will be leaving uh, be leaving her family for the first time, entering the freshman year of college, and this is sometimes a, a hard journey. It'll be hard for Troy and Terry as um, they'll have no kids at home for a, for a few weeks, a few months. And so there is a, a, a period of time of adjustment here, and we pray for that family. We continue to pray for Lang and Camille and Macy as they continue their journey into adulthood and will begin their sophomore year in school. And we pray for our local students here in our school system uh, that the steps that are being taken to provide education for the kids both locally and, and in the church here uh, that we'll continue to do the best we can in that regard. We want to thank you, Lord, for all the ways you continue to bless us day by day. We're thankful again for Jesus coming, dying for our sins. We pray, Lord, that you look down upon us and forgive us when we fail you. And we pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. You notice I got some help this morning, so we're going to sing this morning. We're going to try to sing some songs that most everybody knows. Number 15, number 1 5. Oh, oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy soul. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy soul. 
with all of thy strength. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy might. Hear, O Israel, thou shalt love thy name. Love the Lord thy God with all of thy strength, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy might. Hear, O Israel. One hundred sixty-seven. Thank 
This song, the Lord's Supper, will be offered. pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we approach your throne this morning thankful for 
the instructions you've left us of how to be right with you and the knowledge of the gift that you gave us through your Son. I pray, Lord, that we will yearn to be with Christ and yearn to be with you and as we continue our life on this earth that we can commune with Christ in this way and partake of these emblems which represent the body of your Son and the cleansing power of his blood that was freely given on the cross. As our thoughts go back to the suffering of Christ and at this time as we partake of this bread, we pray that we will draw our minds from the thoughts of the world and to think of this wonderful gift that allows us to be reminded of the love that you had for us and eternity that you've promised us. Be with us now as we partake in Christ's name. Amen. Pray with me. Dear God, as we continue this memorial, we're so thankful that we can gather around your table in your presence and remember the sacrifice that your son made for us. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, may our minds go back to that cross where Jesus died and shed his blood for us. And as we partake of this, may we all never forget the love that Jesus had for us. It's through him we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to contemplate the many blessings that you've given us. And Father, as we have set aside this morning a monetary gift so that the work here can continue, may we reflect on the many blessings outside of what's in our pocket, such as our health, our community, our church family. And Father, we know that we have a peace because of you that so many can't yet reach. May we give and may we act in our community in a way that others may reach this peace in a time that is so desperately needed. May we give with a cheerful heart. In Christ's name, amen. Once again, good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. Beautiful day outside. Forecast of possibility of rain next couple of three days. Rain's always a blessing. Not sure I want to get it like they're getting it in South Texas today. But uh, anyway, I guess we'll just take what we get. This morning we're going to be looking again in the book of Ecclesiastes. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 4 through 8. Uh, this morning. Now, while you're turning there and looking at it, I want us to begin thinking about the author of the book, Solomon. Solomon, we've been seeing as we've worked our way through the first three chapters, has uh, tried things, trying to find meaning in life, trying to find uh, purpose, trying to find happiness. Uh, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? Uh, all of those questions that we often, uh, so often find ourselves saying and thinking about and, and trying to get answers for. And Solomon is, has recorded all of this by inspiration. All of this after the fact, after he's looked at so many things. Now, you might say that Solomon had an advantage because he was rich. He was wise. In fact, in his, in his heyday, I think we could probably say uh, that Solomon was the most successful man around. I mean, he was the, he was the king of Israel. 
He was, in, uh, to put it in our terms of what we might think about today, he was uh, chairman of the board, he was president, he was a chief executive officer, he was the uh, major stockholder, he had all these positive things that we look at and we say, yeah, that's success, that's the thing we're striving for, that's the thing we're wanting to do. Solomon had it all. He was uh, known uh, for his wealth. He was known for his power. He, he had all of that, we might look at and say, because he was king. And to a degree, that's true. But Solomon also, uh, his wealth and his power were not automatic. If you go back and look at the Old Testament, when David dies and Solomon is is named his successor and is coming into power. Solomon, uh, really, he had to had, uh, fight off numerous rivals in order to be able to uh, reach that point and to uh, become king and to have the wealth and the power that he did have. In other words, we could say that Solomon knows exactly what it's like to be a part of what we sometimes call the rat race. He went through it. He's, he's been through the mill. He, he goes through it and he, he tries it and, and he faces the same things that you and I do as we go about trying to, to uh, uh, be successful. And so as we think about that, Solomon uh, is one we need to listen to. He's talking from experience. Yes, he's talking by inspiration, but experience is behind that, what he's saying, and God's inspiring him to write it down, to remember the things and to, to put it down. You know, <clears throat> when we look at our world, success is often the carrot on the stick that's out in front of us, isn't it? That's what we're reaching for, that's what we're striving for. This guy in the picture here is, is reaching at it with both hands. But I want you to notice where the carrot is. It's on the stick. And the other end of the stick is attached to his head. So is he ever going to reach the carrot? Is he ever going to reach the success? No. But he's still trying. And that describes our world. That may describe us. That may be, may be the way that we look at things and the way that we're experiencing things as we go through life uh, as well. You know, success, we are told, uh, is the motivation for greater performance, for more achievements in, in business, in school, even sometimes in ministry. Uh, whether we're talking about uh, the preacher or we're talking about a Bible class teacher or whatever way that we serve, whatever way that we minister in, in, the, in the church, success, we're told, is the thing that we want, the thing that we're going for. And so we're told that we need to dress for success. We need to drive for success. We need to obtain the, the status symbols of success. And above all, we've got to be willing to sacrifice Everything, if necessary, in order to achieve, all in the name of achieving success. Solomon then uh, tells us when he looks at success from a worldly perspective that it is all a mindless drive, that there's nothing to it, that it's all vanity and striving after the wind. It's another one of those things that he says, why? What's the purpose of all of this drive for success? Now, understand, and we'll see, I think, as we go through the, these verses this morning, Solomon is not condemning success in itself. And he's not encouraging the opposite of that, of laziness. He's not encouraging laziness with regard to our living and striving to make a living. Look, for example, here at verse 5 in, in chapter 4. 
Solomon says there in, in that verse, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. So he's, he's not talking about not even trying. He's not talking about being lazy. He's just wanting us to look at and to understand uh, really the true perspective on, on success. He doesn't question uh, success, but what he does question is what are our motives for success? And so this morning we're going to be looking at success versus satisfaction. In these verses, chapter 4, verses 4 through 8, will serve as our text. And it doesn't matter how you define success or what you're what you think of or what people that you associate with think of is how do you say, well, I'm successful. I've reached this plateau. I've, I've reached this level where I can say my life is a success. My business is a success. My family is a success. What Solomon, he's, Solomon's not talking about any of that. Solomon is talking about what's your motivation. Why are, what motivates you in this Rat race. Let's look then, first of all, at uh, three faulty motives for success that Solomon addresses in, in these verses. In verse 4, Solomon charges us and he says, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of Rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after wind. So the first faulty motive for success is competitiveness. You don't know anybody that's competitive, do you? I'm not necessarily talking about in athletics or anything like that. I'm talking about in business, in life competing with, with whoever, with whatever, for, for whatever they, that they're talking about. Com, uh, competitiveness. Now, this, this is, is certainly an overstatement that, that Solomon makes here in verse 4, but it's intended to make a point. We're not to understand here as he makes this statement, we're not to understand that no one ever does a good job simply for the sake of doing what's right. That's not what Solomon's saying. He says as he looks out and looks around at everything that, that goes on, that he sees a lot of this competitiveness. And then most people, perhaps, he would say, uh, generally are motivated by envy, competitiveness, and they are what drive people to, to try and go all out for success. I've got to be the best. I've got to go beyond so and so. And I've got to do better than this competitor. And I've got to, and just so on and so on he's talking about. Now, Solomon's not necessarily condemning competition. He's not saying that competition is wrong. Some competition is good and it is healthy. But if our primary motive is uh, for doing well is the, the compulsion to outdo someone else, then something's wrong. Something's wrong. It's, it's not wrong to do good, but what motivates us to do good? The push for success often marks some unhealthy psychological tendencies. Our culture has the mindset of being highly competitive. And as Christians, you and I are not to be consumed by that competitive spirit in any field. Com competition is good. Again, don't misunderstand Solomon and what he's saying here, but he says it's not to be our primary motive. For example, how often have you heard that, that 
you need to push and you need to work toward being number one. If you're not number one, you're no, you're you're nothing. You're zero. Or you need to be. You need to always strive. And and there's nothing wrong with doing your best, but we need to keep a proper perspective on it. We're told not to keep, not to be content with keeping up with the Joneses. We need to be outdoing the Joneses, going beyond what they can do and show them up. And some people drill that idea into their heads of their children at such an early age that that one psychologist has called it the hurried child syndrome. We need to remember that it was our master who said that those who are blessed are those who are meek and merciful and peacemakers. Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, uh, 5, 7, and 9. Those, those traits are talked about by Jesus. Our Master also said that we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Now that'll, put a, that'll take the edge off of the competition, won't it? That'll put our, our drive for doing well, for success, if you will, that will put our drive in the proper perspective and not try to just down beat them down and do better than them. Much of our modern competitive spirit leaves little or no room for these attributes that Jesus said we all need to have and that we all need to follow. Competition with our neighbor is not wrong as long as we can do it and still love our neighbor as ourselves. Otherwise, to use Solomon's words, it's all vanity and striving after wind. Faulty motive number two, verses seven and eight, he talks about greed. Greed. Look at those two verses. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses seven and eight. Then I looked again, he says, at vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, and for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity. And it is a grievous task. Solomon describes here a person who is motivated not so much by envy or competition, but uh, one who is motivated by greed, by that insatiable desire to have more. Got to have more. Got to gain more. Got to have more. And, and, and competitive can. I mean, uh, yeah, competitive can can enter into this picture as well. Indeed, Solomon says, his eyes are not satisfied with riches. It's like the man we had up while ago that chasing that carrot and it's always out there in front of him and he's always striving to reach it and got to go further and got to do more and got to, to reach harder and he never reaches it. That's why we call it an insatiable. It can't be satisfied as he moves uh, through life and, and, and takes, takes all of this on. The trouble is that idea of insatiable. If getting and having more is your motive, then more will never be enough. You'll never reach that point when you say, Okay, I've arrived. I'm at the point. Because of this insatiable desire, it will continue to be enough. Somehow, you and I, and and, and our culture even, we have to divest ourselves of of that idea that that the more we have, the happier we are. It's just not true. But it's an idea that dies hard, isn't it? 
You remember an occasion in the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 12. A man comes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And Jesus turns and he looks at the man and he says, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? And then Jesus says, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Well, that's Luke chapter 12, verses 13, 14, and 15. Not even when he has an abundance. It's not going to make him happy. It's not going to draw him closer to God. It's not going to put him in a better position. It's only going to make him more miserable because he still doesn't have enough even when he has an abundance of things. You see, the problem with this more is better kind of philosophy is that abundance uh, is not the abundance, but it is the delusion that abundance brings happiness. If that were true, if abundance brought happiness, then why are so many millionaires unable to hold their marriages together? Why are so many uh, millionaires so dependent, and, and it's not exclusive to millionaires, but dependent upon alcohol and drugs? Why does, does the abuse of alcohol and drugs exist among the wealthy if wealth makes you happy, if wealth is the, is the sign of success? Why do depression and suicide and other evidences of unhappiness present themselves in the lives of the rich. And again, it's not just the rich. So let's make it a little more personal. If you, think about yourself, if you have been engaged in a struggle for success and have gotten what the world calls a measure of it, are you happier now than you were before? What's your motive for success? You know, we need to read again what Paul would write to the church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, Paul says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content whatever circumstances I am in. I know how to get along with humble me. And I know how to live in prosperity. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. Both having abundance and suffering need. And then he says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Faulty motive number three. Again, verses seven and eight, and that is purposelessness. Having no purpose. This is even less, uh, less understandable than competition, less understandable than, than greed, being motivated by greed. And this is the person who works himself to death and does not even know why. We call him today a workaholic. A workaholic. What purpose is there for it? What's he accomplishing? Solomon marvels at this in verses 7 and 8. And we read those verses just a few minutes ago. This is an ancient description of a workaholic. There is no end to his labor, Solomon says. He's not satisfied with riches. And he has no one with whom to share those riches. You notice he said 
This man has neither son nor brother nor anyone else. He has nobody to share the results of his labor. And so the question really comes down to this. What's the point? What's the point? Solomon says, here's the point. There isn't one. This too, he says, is grievous, is vanity, and is a grievous task. There are lots of social and psychological implications of workaholism, of a workaholic. But we need to recognize that it contains underlying spiritual problems as well. So Solomon talks about these three faulty motives, competition, greed, and purposelessness. So what then is the alternative? What what is to be our motivation for success? What do we how do we define and how do we measure success? Well in verse 6, Solomon has the audacity to suggest that the drive for success may be misplaced. Look at verse 6 here in chapter 4. He says, One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. Do you see that? One hand full of rest is better than both hands full of labor and striving after wind. You don't see there's a there's there's a better motive. There is an alternative to what he said. The alternative is to settle for less if necessary in order to have peace in your life. Settle for less. And so he says it's better to it, This is better, he says, settling for peace or reaching peace is better than having it all and being miserable. Again, go back to those rich people we were just talking about. that We would look at and say, well, they've got it all. But they're miserable. They're miserable. So far... In Ecclesiastes, Solomon has pointed to this truth repeatedly. Turn back into chapter 2 here of Ecclesiastes. I want to read a couple of verses there and then a few from chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 24. Solomon says, There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Solomon's saying there that that, that success is really seen not in what we have, but in having a relationship with God. Chapter 3 here in Ecclesiastes, verse 12 and 13. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is the gift of God. And then down to verse 22 here in chapter 3. I have seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in his activities for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? Solomon wants us to know from his experience and from his inspiration from God that our goal should be to spend our lives doing something worthwhile. There's nothing better. That's what we just read in verse 24. There's nothing better. Actually, I read, what did I read? 
I did read verse 22. There is not a 224. Yes, there is. I'm looking at three. My mistake. It is 224 that we read uh, to begin with. There's nothing better than, than to spend our lives doing something worthwhile. Serving God, remembering God, loving our neighbors as ourselves, being meek and, and uh, merciful and peacemakers and all the things that Jesus talks about there in the Beatitudes. Not everyone has the option of enjoyable work. But if you do, recognize what a great blessing that it is. Is it really better to spend your life doing something you despise because it will make you successful, quote-unquote, materially? Satisfaction needs to come from doing our jobs, not from meeting someone else's criteria for success. Peace and contentment in life are God's gifts to those that please Him. Look at chapter 2, verse 26. For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. While to the sinner, he has given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after wind. Satisfaction begins with the success of living a life that's pleasing to God. After all of his experiences, Solomon would have given the definition of success that is different from the one that we hear and the one that we see demonstrated every day. Success, according to Solomon, is serving God and finding enjoyment in the life that God gives us. Jesus said something along the same line. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He said, but seek first His kingdom, that is God's kingdom, and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first. If you, want to, if you do that, you will be truly successful in this life. That is, successful in the eyes of God. What a blessing it is to be to know God, and to be able to read His Word and to know what He's revealed, what He says in in the pages of His Word. Everything here was written by God as, as He inspired the men who actually put pen to paper to write it down. Serving God, doing His will, It's what Solomon's going to end up saying in the end of Ecclesiastes, isn't it? Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole of man. There's success. There's success in this life, but more importantly, there is success for eternity. It begins with obeying what Jesus says. As He brought God's Word to us, when He came to this earth. He said to repent and be baptized. He said to begin in that way and then to be faithful all the days of your life to serving God. If there's something that we can do this morning to help you in that, if, it's, if you've not been baptized, everything's ready and prepared to do that very thing. But if you have been, And you need our prayers for strength. You need our prayers for encouragement to to go before the Father. If there's something in your life you need to repent of as a Christian, 
And we'll pray with you and for you before our Father. If we can help you in any way, won't you come and make that known as we stand and we sing. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, God, follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We steps of Jesus where'er they go. Though they lead o'er the gold dark mountain sea, <coughs> or along by Saloma's mountains, it be the weak. Footprints of Jesus, and make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. Thank you, Denny. Closing song went over 745. Once again, we are glad that you're here. Remind every one of the ones that were mentioned that are sick. And definitely, as, as Denny said, the, the phones do work if we can't go visit. So give the people a call and let us know here at the church if someone is in need of any assistance at all. We'll sing all five verses of this song, and then I'm going to ask John Croft to dismiss us. 745. On, on yourself in the side of the Lord. On yourself in the side of the Lord. And he will let you up. And he will let you up. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God, and He died for us, and He died for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that said a wreck like me, that saved a wreck like me. When we've been there ten thousand years, when we've been there ten thousand Bright shining as the sun, bright shining as the sun. Hum yourself in the sight of the Lord. Hum yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will let. bow with me. Our most righteous and heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come on this day that you've set aside for us to worship, sing praises to you, remember your son's death on a cross, 
edify and lift up one another. We thank you for this day that you've set aside for us to do that. Our Heavenly Father, we have those of our members that are ill, both physically and spiritually. We ask that you be with those, be with the hands that are tending to their needs, that they can make the right decisions and those people will be back in our midst. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with our country. As we go through some struggles that we are not understanding, but that we have a desire to come back and worship you and be with you, even the struggles of our country should not stop that. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son and his death on the cross. It saddens us that it's because of us that he had to die on the cross for our sins. But we thank you and what it means for us is eternal life. Our Heavenly Father, as we leave, go through this next week, we ask that you continue to be with us, continue to guide us. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.